Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, and welcome to another People's Christian Fellowship Online Sunday Worship. It is always a joy to have you fellowshipping with us. We hope you really know that, and we really do hope and pray that you are always blessed with the ministry that we're presenting online. Um, you know, for me, um, you know, we, I miss our fellowship so much. I miss our brothers and sisters, and so this week... We've got a few testimonies from some of the members of our church. Um, Elder Martin's going to be coming with the word. And uh, we're just going to have a, a time of praise and worship with our praise and worship team. And also Sister Erica's going to come in. She's always got something special to share with us. You know, I've been thinking, um, every time I, I know it's on television, that, that someone comes out of... Um, a coma or intensive care, when you see those things on television, you know, I praise God. I'm so happy. I don't know who the person might be, but I'm praising God and thanking God that another person has come through. And let's continue to pray for each other and pray for others also. Pray for our nurses and doctors and people who are in that field. I tell you, God bless every nurse, every doctor, every cleaner in the hospital, every administrator in the hospital, Every worker in the hospital, God bless the NHS. And um, our family's been out on the doorsteps every Thursday, clapping and trying to put our support and let our support be, be known. In a few moments, we're going to be singing another hymn. I hope you've been enjoying singing them. I, I certainly have. We're going to sing It Is Well, a, a hymn that has a, an incredible history. The writer went through some serious challenges in his life. In fact, he lost four of his daughters at sea to an accident and while he was on his way to, to meet his wife who was um, bereaved and they were going to comfort each other, he passed nearby where his daughters had gone down and he was inspired at that moment to write this great song, It Is Well, It Is Well With My Soul. And whatever challenges we may be going through, let us always have that confidence, let's have that confidence that if we trust in Christ, if we have faith in him, all will be well. God bless you. I'm going to leave you uh, to listen to some of the testimonies of some of our members right now and then we're going to come back and sing the hymn together so i'm going to invite sister diane first to come and share her testimony in jesus name in january i began prayer and fasting as i started i started to feel like dizzy on the first day so what i did was i changed my mind and i decided what i'm going to do is i'm just going to do like cut out the foods, certain foods and that, and stop watching TV and that. So I decided because I've got um, cardiomyopathy and also I've got stage three heart failure, I take a lot of tablets for that, which I've been diagnosed with cardiomyopathy since 2003. And in the past two years, they said to me that Oh, I didn't have long to live. But, you know, by God's grace and mercies, I'm still here. So, but I thought what I'm going to do is, last year I had a really rough year because I fell and dislocated my shoulder. So what I decided I was going to do this year was to really take everything to the Lord and pray and also give him thanks that he still brought me through. Anyway, what happened was one after the third day, I was feeling a bit faint, so I decided to lie down. So as I lay down, I laid on my left side. Suddenly on my right side, I had this deep whisper in my ears and it sounded like a man. And I thought, and the, the voice just said power. And also it, there was a like a touch, a slight touch. And it felt like a tongue, a touch of my ears. When I came to, I just looked up and I couldn't see anyone. So I thought, oh, that's strange. Maybe there's something else that's going to be said to me. Anyway, after a little while, I got up and I thought, let me get my Bible out. So I did get my Bible out and I opened it up and it went straight to 2 Chronicles 32. And I've never, ever read this before. So when I looked down, it, my eyes was directed to 24, verses 24 to 26. And it talks about Ezekiah being sick and near to death like me he spoke to the lord and he gave him a sign it talks about ezekiah not repaying according to the favor god shows him so god sends his wrath on ezekiah judah and jerusalem then ezekiah and judah and jerusalem they then go and repent 
and God's wrath left them. I also read um, 1 Peter 5.11 which says all power belongs to God now and forever, which it does. All power does belong to God and it's up to him to decide on all things. We can't change anything, only God can. We just have to acknowledge God, repent and he will do the rest. Proverbs 3, 5, 6 says that we have to trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not on our own understanding. In all our ways we must acknowledge him and he will direct our paths. I also um, love this song by Andre Crouch. Andre Crouch was a man, he's not alive now, but he, suffered, he had issues with his heart as well. And I believe this was when he wrote this, he actually wrote this song, but I'm not sure. I just know that he sang it and he said it meant a lot to him. And what it says is through it all, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. I've learned to trust in God. And it goes on and it says, I've learned to depend upon his word. And it goes on with quite a lot more. And it just sums up my life, this whole song. And I began to think that maybe I should use my God-given power through the Holy Spirit to build others up, to win souls for the Lord, to do good and to encourage others showing love as God loved us. Also, I know that God has kept me. Like I said, two years, they said two years ago that I didn't have long to live. But you see, God has kept me. No one can decide but God whether I live or die. So what I do is each day I just give him all the honour, the praise and the glory that he's kept me and brought me through. Amen. Father God, thank you. I thank you, I thank you. I must say this in 18... 2018, I was ill. I had pneumonia and I was very ill. The doctor said to me that, so to my sister, she's very ill but she's healthy and she couldn't understand what he meant. But you see, God was with, there with me. He was keeping me. And I get through, I was in the hospital for a few weeks. And I came out, <clears throat> but ever since then, I never feel myself. And last year, the same thing happened again. I didn't have pneumonia, but the same sickness take me again last year. And then from one thing to the other, from about August, September, in November, I should have a knee operation. And I didn't have it hard was to cancel it because I couldn't stand up. I was doing the right knee and the left knee, I couldn't stand on it. So I had was to cancel. And they put it off for six months. And this year now, when I should review again to have it done, this corona started. But thank God. God helped me and have people around me that looking after me doing like a bit of shopping for me. My friends, them across the way, they shop for me that I don't have to go out the street. And I thank them. I praise them. I thank God for them. I ask God to give them the strength and give me the strength to cope with what is going on around me. And even my church brothers and sister, my church family. They are so much in touch. You know, sometimes three times a day, somebody from church call me to find out how I'm doing. If I'm all right, if I have thing to eat, if I have shopping, I tell them yes. You know, and even when I feel in down sometime and a call come true. I just feel happy again to know that my church brothers them, my church family care so much that they keep phoning to find out how I am. And whatever we do or say, just put our trust in the Lord and have faith and believe in him because without him, we are nothing and we can do nothing. And I just thank him for my life for salvation, for health and strength. I thank him for every many blessings that he bestowed upon me. 
In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Hello everyone. I just wanted to share something that I feel as though God has laid on my heart. And that has been through this whole quarantine time. As at the start of this quarantine, I was very booked and busy on trying to just complete all my coursework. And so I was focusing on my time and energy on just, you know, making sure it's good. And I complete it within the deadline. And, um, you know, finally I can say, you know, thank you God that I finally finished my coursework. So, you know, all that weight has just definitely been lifted off my shoulder. But in my spare time, I've been, you know, making sure that I build a close relationship with God. And so this consists of praying and, you know, reading God's word and studying God's word and just, you know, doing daily devotions as well. And um, one of the daily devotions that I read on was about worrying. And, you know, it's very easy to worry about things or worry about someone else. And, um, you know, the man um, quoted something that I'm going to read in a minute. And what he said, you know, really hit me. And I was like, wow, like I shouldn't actually have to worry. And what he said was, worry is a sin of distrusting the promises and power of God. And, you know, I thought to myself, you know what, I shouldn't actually have to worry all the time or be concerned all the time, you know, and that God has always got us in his hands and, you know, he'll never leave you, never forsake you. He's just, he's always, you know, going to help you whenever you feel down or whenever you feel stressed. He's always got us. And um, what the man um, gave a great idea about was um, having a God box and what the God box symbolizes is all the worries and concerns that you may have. It can be about uni, it can be about college work, it can be about relationships, it can be about you know health, marriage, anything that you're worried about. Um, you put all your worries in the God box and it symbolizes you know you passing all your worries onto God in this God box. And, um, you know, I worry a lot about the future, what the future may hold for me, what I want to do in, towards the future. And so, you know, I put all that worry, all that concern, and I just put it in the God box and I pray about it and, you know, ask God to, you know, reveal what he has planned for me as I know that, you know, he... He loves me and he will never leave me or nor forsake me and that I know that he will never leave or forsake you. I know that God will always guide me to the right path and I know that he will do the exact same for you. And so I encourage you um, throughout the day, whenever you get the chance, each day to just take time out and to read God's word and to just pray and just build that faith with him. And so... Yeah, I hope you're blessed by this and have a good day.
should come. Yeah. 
Father, we pray. We pray in the name of Jesus. Help us to live with that assurance. Help us to live with that confidence. Help us to be true worshippers. We belong to you. Our faith and our trust is in you. Our hope is in you. We love you, Lord. We want to love you more. We want to know you better. Thank you for salvation. And for those of us who are uncertain, help us to work out our salvation. You've blessed us with, Lord, with fear and with trembling. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We just give you praise. We give you glory, Lord, for you're worthy of the praise from the rising of the sun to the going down of the same. Lord, you're worthy. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your promise. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning PCF or good afternoon or evening depending on where you're watching us from this morning I want to greet you all in the mighty name of Jesus. Let's start with the birthday so if you are celebrating your birthday this week we want to wish you a wonderful day have a great time celebrating and if it's your anniversary we pray God's blessing on your marriage thank God for seeing you through another year and we pray that you have a great day celebrating together. Now, I'm not sure about you, but I feel like our world is in need of healing. We're not just dealing with this global pandemic known as the coronavirus, but there are so many painful things happening in our world and we need God. We need God more than ever. Now, if you've been watching the news this week or you've been on your social media, you would have seen the heartbreaking and devastating scenes of racial injustice. And it's not just in America. These things are happening all over the world. And it's not just racial. Every day, thousands of Christians are martyred. They lose their lives. Why? Because of their faith, because they profess the name of Jesus Christ. There are people that lose their jobs, nurses, doctors, care, care workers, who perhaps thought about comforting someone by praying for them and as a result lost their jobs or by someone sharing their faith in their workplace they were had to go through some sort of disciplinary all of these things happen every day we're just not privy to recordings of them there are different scales and and more than ever we need god we need god now i believe that god wants us to speak out against these things the bible does not condone condone injustice you know jesus called it out he spoke against it you know, so we are to use our voice to affect change, not just our voices. We, we can sign petitions, we can get involved in, in peaceful protests. All of these things are good. But one thing that I wanted to point out today is that we must also be careful of what these things that we see, what they, what they stir up in us, what happens in our hearts, what's happening in our own hearts. The scripture that I want to share today is taken from Luke chapter 12, Luke 12 verses 13 to 15. And it says, then someone from the crowd, sorry, then someone called from the crowd, teacher, please tell my brother to divide our father's estate with me. Jesus replied, friend, who made me judge over you to decide such things as that? Then he said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Now, in this uh, passage, the, the, the person who called out from the crowd was trying to draw Jesus' attention to some form of injustice in his own life. Perhaps he had been denied what was rightfully his. Perhaps his brother had not shared equally the estate with him and he wanted Jesus to address it. What's interesting is that Jesus doesn't address it in the way that this man expects. He doesn't ask for more questions or tell me more and, and you know, he doesn't go for the other brother and says, why have you done this? Instead, he goes directly to the man's heart and he says, beware, guard against the greed, guard against what's happening in your heart. I say this to say that with everything that's going on, we will be hurt, we will be heartbroken. And rightly so, we should be moved, we should be grieved by some of the things that are happening. But we must also be careful that we don't allow these things to cause us to be hateful. That we don't allow these things to change the language that we speak and the narratives that we share, even in the confines of our own home. 
We must still love. We must still show love in the way that we speak. We can speak out against injustice, but we must still remain the people that God called us to be. Jesus said himself, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. And that seems difficult sometimes with everything that you see around us, but that's who Jesus called us to be. So I leave you with this thought. Be a part of change, affect change. Take part in, in peaceful protests, as I say, sign petitions. Do all that you can to speak out against the things that are happening, not just in America, but right here. But just be careful also, be aware of some of the things that it may stir up in you. I pray that God blesses this word and that it, you, know, you find something encouraging from it. Now for the notices. So last week, Pastor David mentioned the Pentecost celebration. So Prayer Haringey will be hosting their very first online service to celebrate Pentecost. And actually that's taking place today at 6.30. The service will be streamed from 6.30 and you can search under Prayer Haringey via Facebook or YouTube and you'll be able to join in. So please remember that 6.30 this evening, let's celebrate Pentecost together. Just search under Prayer Haringey and you will be able able to access the service. I mentioned last week about the choir's ministry. So if you've been enjoying the recordings and the singing, you can get in touch with us. Email us at connect at tpcf.org.uk and we will get a CD out to you ASAP. Prayer and fasting this week is from 12 to 3. So we'll be fasting from 12 to 3 p.m. And then at 7 p.m. we will have prayer meeting as usual. Don't forget to click on our website, have a look at the donate page. We thank you. I say it every week and I will continue to say it. We thank you all for the many ways that you've continued to support this ministry, even in light of the circumstances. So on behalf of our leaders, we want to say thank you. Visit the donate page and you can see how you can continue to support us. And finally, um, please continue to connect with your respective groups. So the young people, the men's, the women's, Contact the department leaders of each group and find out how you can stay connected. I know that the Illuminate group still meet on a Thursday via Zoom and the young people still meet on a Friday via Zoom. So please get in touch with your department leader and find out how you can stay connected. It's important that we try and stay connected in these times. I believe that's all the notices for this week. And um, finally, if you have a testimony and something you want to share, Remember that website, connect at tpcf.org.uk. Or if you just want some prayer, you want someone to stand with you, you can also email us and somebody will get in touch with you. That's all from me this week. Have a good week. Please look after yourself. Stay safe. May God bless you. Take care.
Good morning, PCF. And I greet you in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is great to be here on this Sunday morning, just seeking the face of God. Please join me as we seek God's word together. We're going to be reading from Colossians chapter 2 today and starting from verse 1 and going on to verse 2. But before we go into that, I just want to say this. I can't wait for us to fellowship again together. This house of worship ultimately is missing one thing. It's missing the worshippers. It's missing you. I can't wait for us to gather together and sing aloud and lift off the roof with praise and honour and worship to God and to God alone. So please, hold tight as we endure this period of time together until we meet again and we come together face to face and are able to worship the Lord. Even as a, as a leadership, our hearts go out to all of those that have lost loved ones during this period of time, whether it be to COVID-19, whether it be to illness or accident, our hearts go out to you. We do not take lightly the grieving or the amount of grieving that's going on in our community. During this time, there are also people that are under pressure at the moment due to the massive job losses or even could be things around mental health and isolation. And with the leadership, we are praying for you. We are praying constantly day and night that God will meet you at your need. Let us turn to the word of God together. The last time I preached, I preached from Colossians chapter 1 and verses 15 to 20 with the beautiful poem that presents the Christ in the fullness of who he is, that he is a source and sustainer of all things. And I want to continue in the same fashion because here in God's word, he outlines a wonderful ministry of the spirit. Paul here proclaims in verses 24 to 28, he highlights the secret, the struggle and the strategy. The secret, the struggle and the strategy. And I'll leave that for you to read in your own time. But here in verse two, on chapter two, verse one, he says this, I want you to know how much I'm struggling for you and for those in Laodicea and for all those I have not, sorry, that have not met me personally. So you can understand that that is also to us. He says in verse two of chapter two, my purpose is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. Church of the living God today, I want to do things a little bit different. I know that most of the sermons that you've seen or all those sermons that you've seen are been in this fashion. And so what we're going to do, we're going to explore a little bit around this piece of text and around those three core aspects, i.e. that the purpose to which Paul has called the church ultimately is to be encouraged in heart, united in love and complete in understanding. When we understand this in a contemporary context, that ultimately we ought to be encouraged in heart. It is understanding that ultimately at this period of time that it's easy to become discouraged with so much negative news out there pertaining to what's going on, whether it be sickness, whether it be instability around our economics or politics, that it's easy to become discouraged. But here he says that we ought to be encouraged in heart. Jesus himself says that in John chapter 16, take heart. I have overcome the world and our confidence is secure in him, knowing that he's never lost, not one. Romans chapter 8 also brings us a wonderful piece of text that encourages our heart that nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. No height or no depth. And so I encourage you, church, today, be encouraged at heart. Be encouraged at heart. Keep your mind settled on him. Keep your focus settled on him. And trust me, if we have faith in him believing, he will see us through. He encourages us and says ultimately that we ought to be unified in love. To have unity in love. Love is a kind of strange thing because ultimately in these days, and I know I seem to use this word ultimately a lot, but these days, love is seen as this kind of feeling-wise, as how you feel towards somebody. 
But in these biblical days, where Paul was going around, the fact of the matter is, is that the expression of love was actually found in the pocket. That part of his mission was to collect money for the, the poorer churches. And he was going around spreading the gospel, but he was called upon the church universal to support the churches that were actually poor. And so there is a pragmatic element to love that actually for us to be unified in love, it means we're all participant in love. We're all given towards it. This church is not about pastors. It's not about deacons and it's not about offices. It's about people who understand that the love of God that they have received in Christ Jesus and the gift of God to which they've received and they give that gift back onto God by serving. It's kind of strange that here in Colossians, there is no offices mentioned. There is no ordinations into offices. They don't have deacons or elders. What they have is people who are gifted and are commissioned. Later on in, 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 in Christendom, you have the establishment of, of offices and structures within church. But here you have people who only know whether they've been gifted and commissioned. And I believe that you, the believers, are gifted. You're very much gifted. And you've also been commissioned to God to do some great things. And I believe together as a church that we can demonstrate the love of God. Here, I want to show you two or three examples of where we can become more pragmatic in church. So follow me. Let's first go outside and see the community into which this church resides. Yep, this is the outside of the church. And it's true, sometimes I miss it too. But the question for me is, now that we've been away for so long, what type of church are we returning to? The officers and the elders unfortunately can't do it all. It's the active citizens of the church, the participants of the church, the ones who are brothers and sisters in Christ that will make a difference. We need to love one another and serve one another in the midst of the church and demonstrate the love of Christ in that. We need to demonstrate solidarity and unity in our approach. But not only that, the church doesn't lie on an island by itself somewhere. It lies right here in the midst of Tottenham in a vibrant community, a community that's thriving with all different religions and all different people. Ultimately, we ought to show the love of God in that serving this community because ultimately, this community is hurting. This community ultimately needs to be fed. This community unfortunately is suffering from high crime rates and, and, and high unemployment rates. And it's those things that affect the community. How much more so should we, the church, the, demonstrate the love of God in this community? So you see that the main question is, is who are we going to become as a church? Especially in the light of that the church resides in a, in a wonderful community, but a community that has some great needs. The fact of the matter is that we can serve in different ways that actually our church's mission is to serve the community, but also to strengthen the body of Christ. In order to strengthen the body of Christ, we need people to participate in the things related to church. Here, I'll give you two pragmatic examples in ways in which you can serve at church. So here, follow me upstairs. Every time I come up here, it seems strange. At the moment, we're stacking chairs in here to accommodate the food bank. But the reality of the matter, I yearn to hear the sound of children learning in this environment, whether it be church service for young people or Sunday school, just the vibrant noise of young people making noise, asking questions and singing. But the fact of the matter is, as much as we want the young people to be up here, we need adults. We need people who are going to volunteer their time in order to minister to the young children. It could be the smallest of things like preparing the biscuits in the kitchen. Or it could be that you're teaching the young person biblical truths. But the fact of the matter is this, what type of church are we returning to? Are we returning to where we have to beg and plead for people to work with young people? Or should we have a long list of people who desire to input into the lives of these young people? I'm one of those people that came to PCF when I was young. And if it were not for those mothers those persons who volunteered to drive the minibus, where would I be? But it was those people that helped shape the life. It was those people that planted the seed in my life that actually, after turning away and going and doing my own thing, about the age of 20, 
I heard the call of God upon my life. And so I asked myself the question again, what type of church are we returning to? We need to love one another and we need to demonstrate that love in a pragmatic way, in our giving of our time and our resources and our talents. This place here, this is the heart of ministry. Now, in as much as I truly believe in that there's an area in church that's thinly veiled between heaven and earth and sometimes you feel the presence of the Lord there is something about the anointing that happens in this place and it's kind of strange that actually it's my favorite place <laughs> sometimes maybe for the wrong reasons say no more but the fact of the matter is this church ultimately people need to eat and this in and of itself is a ministry within itself and I'm telling you to serve within this ministry is an honor and a privilege. But the matter of fact is that we need people and we always need people to serve. And it is a blessing to serve. And so I encourage you that in the midst of this blessing that we have, many a time I invite people from external in to show them around the church and show them the sanctuary and show them the upstairs hall to which most of the time they're very, they're like, oh, that's an amazing space up here. But the one place they didn't anticipate is when they work, walk into a commercial kitchen. That here at PCF, we have a commercial kitchen. My question is, how can this space better serve both the church and the community? And whilst we're here in this place of meditation and isolation and we're not fellowshipping, this is time for us to think, how can we serve more? How can we utilize the space to bless somebody? That food ministry, I don't know whether that food ministry is a blessing or an overweight curse, I'm not sure. But the church ultimately is a place where people are serving together. It's not just about leadership, the deacons and the elders, it's about everybody participating together. And the central question is when we come back as a people, whom are we coming as? Are we coming as ones that will just let other people do the work or are we coming as ones that will serve? There's a reality that exists and actually that this church right now, it serves as two central functions. It serves as a place where the word is preached and it serves as a place that serves others. Here, I'll give you the example. Right now, the church ultimately, it serves almost like a studio. And as you can see, what's missing here is you, the congregation, the people in the seats the people worshiping and ultimately the sanctuary serves as a storage for the food bank we've moved it downstairs because upstairs the food was getting a bit too hot so we've moved all of the food down here and every two days and two days a week the food bank runs from inside church it's quite ironic at present that the two central purposes that we have to spread the gospel and to serve the community are actually happening right here. That the preaching is happening every single week from here in the sanctuary and ultimately the food is being served from here in the sanctuary. But the one thing that all of these ministries need is people. It's people like you that the ministries need to survive in order to thrive. Here in the text, Paul identifies three things. Number one, that we may be encouraged at heart, unified in love, and third, that we be complete in understanding. And the understanding is projected towards or projected towards the Christ, this mystery of God that has been revealed in whom he is. And we are the worshippers of God through Christ Jesus. Now, it's once said that whoever you worship is whoever you become. And so I'm praying that we become more like Christ, not just in serving God in worship, but ultimately in serving God in loving one another. When we return, what type of church are we returning? I believe that we are submerged at the moment, like in baptism that we are submerged at the moment at church. We're going through a time like no other time in church history, where we've been apart for so long, scattered in our own individual homes, 
worshiping and praying still, but not in corporate worship together face to face. But out of the submerging, just like baptism, there is an emerging. There is a coming forth. And I'm praying that we come forth as new, as refreshed, as revived, as ones that are energized in the spirit, desiring to serve God continuously that the ministries within this church will thrive, that we'll have oversubscription when we need persons to volunteer, whether it be in the kitchen, in cleaning, in teaching, that there'll be too many people coming forward that we have to turn away rather than having to beg for people to come. That we all have had time to stop and reflect on the things pertaining to God, to get new perspectives on lives, to get new perspectives on what is important. And that has produced in us a willingness, a desire to serve God. Church of the living God, please join me as in, pr in prayer as we close, as we reflect upon this word. Most gracious and eternal Father, first and foremost, we acknowledge who you are, that you are sovereign king over all creation. We thank you, Father, for the secret, the struggle and the strategy. As fathers, we contend with the purpose to which Paul outlines here, that we be encouraged in heart, that father, we be united in love and that father, we'll be complete in understanding of who you are and the mystery that's been revealed in Christ Jesus, your son. I'm praying, Father, that we be energized through this time in a yearning and a desiring to serve you more, O oh God to demonstrate the love of God by the pragmatic elements that we can do here in this fellowship. And I believe, Father, by the virtue of serving, of serving not just ourselves, but serving our community, Father, that your kingdom will grow, that people will meet the love of God just in the small provisions that we provide. And that, Father, they will come to know you through how we serve. We present all these things to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Church, this week, continue to meditate on the Word of God. I'm stuck here in the book of Colossians and guaranteed that if I do preach again, it will probably be from the same book of Colossians. So please join me this week in meditating on the things Paul says to the church in Coloss. As I greet you in the name of Jesus. Amen. We thank God for his word today and may we truly, truly be united in our love for God and our love for each other and may we find pleasure and joy in serving each other. We thank God for the Holy Spirit who is with us, who fills us, who sealed us, who empowers us, who influences us in the fruit of Christianity and today is Pentecost Sunday so be blessed today. Let's pronounce the benediction together. And now, may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, may he rest, remain, and abide with us all, both now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week in Jesus' name.